Okay, I think that's probably given uh, everybody a chance to, to get in through the, the queue of Zoom. So uh, thanks very much to everybody for uh, joining this webinar. Um, this is a presentation which is going to cover uh, the impact of electric vehicle charging on grid short-term frequency and voltage stability uh, and cascade fault recovery uh, and prevention. And let's start by asking the question, what makes this uh, project in this presentation different from all of the others that you might have heard uh, about EVs and EV charging previously? So first of all, uh, the key point to note is that EV charging is more than just about kilowatt hours that it takes to put into an EV uh, to take an empty battery and fill it. Um, this particular project uh, is focusing on what happens in the first few seconds after a, a fault has occurred. That fight, fault might be a lightning strike, it might be a short power outage, it might be communication failure, it might be some failure in control systems. Uh, but with mass adoption of EVs, the load on the grid is going to be very, very different to that which it has been in the past. And that means it will behave in a very different manner. And the objective of this project, Project REV, uh, is to try and understand how uh, the behaviour of the grid will change. This project has been undertaken in conjunction with uh, National Grid ESO. Uh, they have funded the project uh, through the Ofgen Network Innovation Allowance Scheme. And this webinar is presenting the key findings of the work to date. And that work to date uh, is work package one. Uh, we're making it, uh, the findings public via this webinar uh, and also via a report. Uh, that report uh, is available from the Energy Systems Catapult. And hopefully for all who registered for the event, uh, you should have been sent a, a link to it already. Uh, and I should say this webinar only covers a small section of what uh, and an overview. So in terms of this webinar, uh, I'm Andrew Larkins. Uh, I'm the CEO uh, here at Sciogensis, and I will be presenting an introduction to the subject area as a whole and trying to set a general context. And later on, uh, you'll hear from my colleague, Martin Bradley, who will go through details of the major risks that we have identified from the impact of EV charging on the grid. Uh, we'll go through what the next steps we are to uh, planning to follow on from the activity we've performed. We aim to take some questions and I'd ask that as we go along, please just drop questions uh, into the chat. Uh, feel free to have a you may base amongst yourselves anyone who wants to jump in and try and answer the question so we don't have to later on, that would be great. Uh, and uh, I would also say after the webinar, please uh, feel free to read the report. If you have any questions that we haven't been able to address, uh, get in touch uh, via the email address. So this project uh, has involved a team of about 20 people uh, from six different organisations. And I'm just going to provide a quick little introduction to myself so you understand my background. Um, I set up Cygensis uh, about 18 months ago. I come from a background of electronic system design and development and innovation across a really broad range of different technologies. Right from the early stages of IC design and development and the transition as it was at the time from analog to digital cell phones. Yes, I really am that old, uh, but have also been involved in high reliability products. And that's very relevant uh, to the discussion today. So that's included medical devices and safety of life uh, internet of things devices. Uh, where if uh, the systems fail, uh, there's a risk of people dying. Um, my background in the uh, electricity distribution uh, sector and technology connected to that 
uh, is I have a, a patent from many years ago uh, on smart metering. More recently, in terms of bidirectional uh, power converters. And as I said, I set the business up about 18 months ago uh, and have recruited uh, a great team around me uh, who come from a very broad range of backgrounds, from having a PhD looking at the impact of EV charging on the LV distribution network. Uh, to someone from a protection engineering background, uh, grid simulation, uh, a member of the team who's been involved in installing distributed energy resources, configuring them, uh, integrating them into uh, virtual power uh, plants, and also experience of wide area uh, monitoring and synchrophasers. So let's go on and talk about uh, the main objective of uh, this session and of the report itself. So the aim is to raise awareness and we're talking to a really broad range of stakeholders. So listed today in the attendees, we have grid operators, distribution companies, regulators, manufacturers of EV charge points, energy uh, companies, aggregators, consultants, not only in the UK, but also around other parts of the world. And that final point is really important uh, because we need to learn from each other. Uh, the problems uh, and the challenges in uh, producing reliable systems uh, and optimizing the performance of EV charging are common across the world in many aspects. So as we're all aware, we're going through a transition to net zero. Uh, that's been ongoing for a number of years in terms of integration of renewable uh, generation sources, uh, particularly in the UK, wind, and to a lesser degree, solar PV. These are intermittent sources. Uh, they are weather dependent. Uh, they depend on when the wind is blowing or when the sun is out. Uh, they've had produced challenges for the grid operators through some of the technical aspects, such as reduction of inertia and changes in short circuit levels. And from the distribution companies, uh, the increase in uh, demand uh, uh, is giving voltage falls, uh, but uh, an increase in distributed generation has actually seen significant voltage rises within networks. Uh, there have also been a number of issues where generators tripping offline under fault conditions have caused coincident tripping of other generators with those going offline in rapid succession, heading towards cascade events. That said, those challenges have been met by grid operators here in the UK uh, and also around the world. And we're in a situation where the lights are staying on with a really high degree of reliability, subject to occasional storm damage, which we all know about recently. Um, what we're anticipating is there are some major new uh, challenges in terms of grid operation. And that comes from increase uh, of demand as we manage the transition to net zero with the electrification of transport. And this project rev is EV specific. And also as we electrify heating increasingly. We're likely to see major increases in demand. Uh, and not only uh, are we going to require more energy uh, for those new loads, we are also going to be faced with the challenge and opportunities which come from smart software controlled loads. Uh, so those loads will allow us uh, to vary the timing uh, of uh, demand and specifically the peaks of demand uh, to better match uh, supply. Uh, that is great in terms of uh, system operations. However, the, this project is highlighting some of the risks uh, that that will introduce and the things that we need to bear in mind going forward so that we can manage that transition in the same way as has happened for generation in such a way that it is smooth and relatively seamless uh, for consumers and still maintains a high degree of security of supply. Project REV uh, is, and this first work package, is purely about identifying risks. So please don't expect to hear any ideas in terms of solutions today. Uh, you'll be sadly disappointed. 
we are focusing on identifying risks and communicating those risks. And we are specifically focusing on risks which are quite a long way off uh, into the future. In the 2030s, when we are seeing mass adoption uh, in the UK of electrification of transport, and also with heat coming on uh, shortly behind that. And the reason for looking 10, 15, even 20 years into the future is to allow time for mitigation actions to take place. So where we're identifying risks now, we're highlighting the potential problems uh, that those could cause. We're not expecting these problems to occur uh, to any large extent in reality, uh, because we anticipate that appropriate mitigation actions will be put in place over the next 10 years. Uh, what we want to do uh, through the report and through this presentation is to highlight those risks. As I have said, uh, we are looking to move to low carbon technologies and it's useful to bear in mind that uh, the GB grid uh, and specifically the LV distribution grid wasn't designed with uh, mass loads and uh, generation uh, at the domestic level. So typically uh, in the UK, uh, the systems were designed for approximately two kilowatts after diversity maximum demand. So if you uh, take a town and you look at the peak load that is going to come from that from uh, domestic properties, uh, the peak you are likely to see will be no more than uh, two kilowatts uh, times the, the number of houses. That's been the situation historically. That is, has been changing uh, fairly rapidly over the last few years with the advent of solar PV. Um, so solar generation, rooftop solar, uh, has the potential to provide power back to the grid. And in some parts uh, of the network, uh, on a sunny day, you will find that there is a net outflow of power with generation at the domestic level uh, and leading to increase in uh, voltages uh, on the grid as a result. What we're seeing next is the demand which is coming from electric vehicles. Uh, and typically EV chargers uh, will more than double uh, the ADMD, the after diversity maximum of heat pumps, further increasing uh, demand on the grid. And that uh, is leading to a need to consider how to manage that demand and how to update the infrastructure to support the uh, increased requirements. And then uh, looking at the generation side, uh, electric vehicle technology as we move forward uh, into the late uh, 2020s and early 2030s will increasingly support vehicle to grid technology. Uh, this has the provision to provide power from the vehicle battery back to the grid. And at times of high solar PV and high uh, vehicle to grid, uh, we'll actually have the potential for significant power outflow from the low voltage distribution grid back uh, into the transmission system. Uh, again, this puts significant challenges on the distribution network operators uh, because of the risk of voltage rise when there's lots of generation and voltage fall when there's great uh, demand. And overall, uh, the increased power uh, requirements have a risk of overloading infrastructure. And let's take a look at how big that change is. So here we have some examples from National Grid uh, from their future energy scenarios. And in all of the scenarios that they are presenting, uh, there will be a 50% increase in peak demand uh, by the late 2030s. A 50% uh, growth in some markets doesn't sound uh, very large, but in terms of uh, the electricity grid, it is a, a faster growth than has been seen uh, since the, uh, the uh, rollout of the uh, grid in GB in the uh, 1930s and 1950s. Not only is there an increase in peak demand, 
There is also a requirement to be able to provide more energy. And again, taking one of the scenarios from National Grid Free Future Energy scenarios, they are looking at an energy requirement of 100% increase. And at first sight, those two figures seem to be in conflict with each other. The peak only going up by 50%, but the amount of energy going up by 100%. The only way that that can be achieved uh, is by reducing the size of the peak to the average. And we'll come on and talk more about that. So on this slide, we're looking at how demand varies through the day. So if I just try and grab myself a pointer, all right. I will get there with my laser pen. So if we look at the overnight period between uh, midnight and 6 a.m., typically demand is relatively uh, low on the grid. As everybody starts to wake up in the morning, we see an increase. And then through the day while everybody is working, uh, demand remains fairly constant. As people arrive home, turn on their, their lights, their heating, start cooking, there tends to be a peak and then it gradually falls off during the evening. And if we look at the green line, uh, dotted line here, this shows the impact of EV charging as an additional demand. And specifically, uh, the line here is looking at unmanaged or dumb EV demand. So this is what would happen if we didn't put any smart control technology. The key point to note here is that typically most EVs in the UK are likely to be charged at home. Uh, people tend to plug them in as they get home from work. We get an increase in uh, demand on the grid as those EVs charge. And as they get uh, full, gradually we'll get a, a decrease. And then uh, through to the middle of the night, there's very little demand. In the morning, we get a, another rise. Uh, and particularly where we have some work part place charging uh, during the middle of the day. But what we see here is that there is a massive peak uh, in demand during the early evening. And that peak demand uh, has the potential uh, to require significant investment uh, in terms of reinforcement of the net network. Uh, that would involve laying new cables, uh, new generation capability, and that is something which is both slow and expensive. Digging up the road, putting new cables in to manage what is a short-term peak for just a few hours uh, is na not a, a great way forward. Uh, it will be necessary in some cases, but we should do everything we possibly can to avoid that peak using some smart technology. The other thing to bear in mind is we are going to have an increasing level of renewable energy generation. Um, and that's not something uh, that you can just turn on uh, when you need it and turn off uh, when you don't need it. Uh, typically, wind turbines and uh, solar panels have almost zero marginal costs of generation. Uh, that means uh, you want them to generate as much power as they possibly can uh, because the fuel is free. Um, that uh, gives you variable timing of that generation. And in an ideal situation, uh, you'd be able to store it. Uh, however, storage is relatively small capacity and expensive. Uh, in the UK, there is a, a small amount of hydro storage, uh, which is, has been incredibly useful in terms of managing uh, GB grid operation. Uh, and we are starting to see battery energy storage systems uh, being deployed. Uh, but those systems are likely to remain relatively expensive. And we want to look uh, at the opportunities going forward uh, in terms of EVs of two specific aspects. One is how can we make the timing of demand more flexible so that the timing of demand better matches supply? Um, is it possible to exploit uh, the energy storage capacity uh, within EV batteries, which is going to be a very large capacity, 
Uh, can we use that to support operation of the grid? So what I'd like to do is look at this next slide where we are trying to address the way in which smart charging could potentially impact peak demand on the grid. And we're specifically uh, focusing on peak demand because peak demand is what would require uh, reinforcement within the grid uh, and anything we can do to reduce that would be really beneficial. So if we start by looking at the midnight to 6 a.m. Uh, period uh, uh, and, and the, the dumb or unmanaged charging, green dotted line here, during this time period, uh, there is likely to be spare capacity within the network. And what we want to be able to do is increase demand during that period and be charging uh, EV batteries uh, in the uh, midnight to 6 a.m. time period. Uh, if we can do that by arranging uh, such that when you get home in your vehicle, it doesn't immediately start charging and produce the, uh, the peak here uh, between 6 and maybe 10 p.m., uh, that actually the uh, EV automatically delays its charging until the early night uh, overnight period, that has a dramatic impact uh, in reducing peak demand. And actually within the graph here, there's a sneaky little bit where we have the, the dotted line for the demand with smart charging, which is actually showing that it's lower than the demand uh, when we're excluding EV. And that is because we are showing a small amount of vehicle to grid contribution here. So this is net transfer of energy from the power, uh, the energy stored in an EV battery to the grid, allowing us to further reduce that peak demand period. So how is this smart charging uh, uh, achieved and what does it really look like? So what we've said is the principal objective uh, of smart charging is to reduce the peak. And reducing the peak, why are we going to do that? Partly because we want to manage constraints. So we are looking to manage the constraint of the peak power transfer capability in the uh, grid infrastructure, in the transmission and distribution infrastructure. And alongside that, we also want to uh, reduce the peak uh, and make that peak more uh, follow the renewable generation so that we can balance supply and demand. Uh, historically, the grid has always generated power uh, to match demand. What we could be looking at going forward is to vary the timing of the demand to match that renewable generation. So what's the benefits of peak reduction? Well, if we reduce the peak, uh, we have uh, a benefit in terms of reducing the need for uh, upgrade in the networks. That's going to help reduce costs. Uh, we also reduce the need uh, for having uh, backup generation uh, from fossil fuels. That's going to help reduce CO2 and achieve environmental goals. Let's have a look at how smart charging could be implemented. So, if we think about what is not smart, um, that's the end user getting home, plugging their vehicle in, six o'clock in the evening, and it charges immediately. That is not smart charging. That's what we want to move away from. And um, what we need to do is incentivize consumers uh, to move away from that. And what we are already seeing in the market uh, are a number of tariffs which provide a fixed time of use tariff. And typically these are tariffs uh, in the overnight period between midnight and 6 a.m., uh, which provide a significantly reduced cost of electricity, sometimes uh, a quarter or less of the, the regular price for that uh, energy. That encourages uh, consumers uh, to time their charging uh, to that uh, period of day. And that can be achieved by many different mechanisms, including really simple fixed timers. And typically most EVs, if not all EVs, will allow you to set that to timed operation. That helps in terms of reducing the peak, but it isn't really all that smart. 
Uh, if we want to look at smart charging, um, what we want to be able to do is uh, for the energy companies, the aggregators, the network operators to provide time of use tariffs, uh, which vary uh, from one day to another, uh, dependent on the forecast availability of generation and the forecast demand and the balance between those two. What we're trying to do is here is to encourage consumers to vary their charging uh, according to the availability of supply and the relative cost of generation and potentially the CO2 content uh, of that generation at any particular time. So uh, within this type of system, that time of use tariff is provided to uh, the electric vehicle or the charge point, the EV service equipment, and that device itself will make the intelligent decision uh, of when to charge for optimum performance for the consumer in terms of price and for the grid operators being able to drive that uh, through the tariff mechanisms. Taking that a stage further, uh, we have the option of another level of smart charging, uh, which is remote dispatch. This is where the EV uh, or EV charger is responding by, to a direct instruction from the grid operator, an aggregator, an energy company to change its rate of charge at a particular time. And to pull this all together, what we need in the middle of this uh, is a market which provides the correct financial incentives to the end user to benefit optimizing uh, the system as a whole so that they are encouraged uh, to use smart charging. Uh, and to the benefit of that whole system operation. So up until this point, we've considered EV uh, and EV smart charging in isolation from the rest of what is going on. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little more about EVs and EV as part of a home energy management system. So EVs are not the only new uh, high power loads that you may have within a home. Uh, you might have a battery uh, storage system in, in your house, you might have a heat pump, you may have uh, new cooking appliances, you might have instant heat, hot water uh, system. The risk is as we are going to these new technologies, the supply to any one house is limited in its capacity, and there is a risk of overloading that supply, uh, blowing the fuse, operating the cutout into the property. Uh, a home energy management system can be used to monitor the current coming in and to smartly control the devices within the building, uh, within the home, so that we don't un uh, overload that supply. Uh, and that would be a very high priority service. Home energy management systems can perform a whole list of other functions, uh, as uh, we've said here. Uh, they may respond to a, a time of use tariff uh, communicated over the internet. They may, for, from a commercial standpoint for the user, try and make sure that any local generation is consumed by local assets, uh, because typically you'll pay much more for energy which is imported uh, compared to excess generation being exported. So EVs and EV charging systems have to be considered in what is a very complex uh, infrastructure. And this type of system uh, is starting to be deployed now and will be commonplace in the 2030s. Within the whole of this, it is really important to think of the size and scale. And just as a quick other view of this, um, forecast for 2035 is uh, 20 or so million vehicles, a seven kilowatt typical charger, 70% of chargers, uh, vehicles being charged at home, that potentially could give 100 gigawatts uh, of a peak demand for EV charging at home. So if at some for some reason, uh, all EV users were to uh, choose to charge their car at the same time, 
uh, you end up with a massive peak demand, uh, which is well beyond the capability uh, of the, the grid, the network infrastructure to be able to uh, supply. That's actually not an unusual uh, position and grid operations and operability relies on the concept of diversity. Not all users doing the same thing at the same time. Not everybody is going to put their cooker on at the same time. Uh, uh, in the same way, not everybody is going to uh, put their EV on to charge at the same time. And, and within most of the forecast currently, somewhere around the 25 gigawatts as a peak demand uh, it is uh, forecast, even in the situation of unmanaged uh, charging in normal situations, so from one day to the next. What we focus on within uh, Project Rev is smart charging systems. They must uh, be able to ensure that we achieve this level of diversity uh, so that we don't end up with herding of lots of EVs doing the same thing at the same time. And they must uh, be able to do that under fault conditions. So if we have a lightning strike or something of, of that sort, we don't want lots of EVs behaving in exactly the same way uh, at the same time. And they also need to be able to behave sensibly when hacked. And there's been lots of debate in the team here, and I have put when rather than if, because over the next 20 years, at some point, EV charging systems will be hacked however careful we are in terms of cyber security, and we ought to recognize that. So moving on, let's think about uh, smart charging system failure. Um, and let's think about that when, uh, during the evening peak, lots of uh, consumers have got home, they plug their vehicle in, and we end up with a situation where all of those uh, vehicles are waiting to charge, uh, that is being controlled uh, through the aggregators and deliberately delaying that charge from the peak time uh, to the overnight period, uh, the midnight until 6 a.m. We then have a situation where we might end up with a, a wide area loss of communication used to control those. That could be an internet service provider going down. It could be a mobile phone network operator going down. Uh, we have the potential for one of the aggregator systems uh, to fail. Uh, we will have cyber attacks. We could have a software bug uh, in the system. And on occasions, you really do get some weird and wonderful software bugs. So uh, over the last few months, uh, within the debates about this project, we talked about someone putting the wrong tariff number in. So uh, putting an extra, putting the decimal point in the wrong place. Um, and uh, last week, uh, we saw the situation uh, where after storm Arwin, um, unfortunately, or fortunately for some consumers, they were offered refund checks from uh, an electricity grid operator, uh, which ran into the trillions of pounds. Uh, through a software bug. So don't think that at some point uh, tariffs won't end up with a decimal place in the wrong point or having the sign changed so you're being paid to use electricity uh, rather than paid to uh, uh, charge for using it. Those types of extremes will happen. But let's go back and take the simple example of a, a wide area loss of communication. Uh, in that type of situation, what's the consumer pr uh, preference? Uh, I'm an EV charger, I, I'm sorry, I'm an EV driver, not a charger, I, uh, and I want to make sure that I can get here uh, to work uh, with a charge battery in the morning. So if the uh, communication system goes down for my smart charger, my preference would be that it defaults uh, to full charge and charges the battery. Um, and if overnight it charges at the right wrong time and I'm charged a little bit extra for that occasionally, I probably don't care too much. Uh, that means uh, that uh, in that situation, the vehicle is ready for me to use in the morning. If we look at that uh, from a grid operator's standpoint, 
uh, putting uh, myself in the position of uh, national grid, ESO or other grid operators around the world, if you have a wide area loss of communication and you suddenly end up with thousands or tens of thousands or 10 million EVs all starting to charge at the same time because of that communication outage, they would see an incredible change in load with the demand on the grid increasing really, really rapidly. Uh, and that gives a major risk of local overloads on the LV distribution network that might not be able to uh, cope with, uh, with that local demand. And it could give major uh, power imbalances uh, at national level uh, and reach a position where the grid becomes unmanageable. So the size and scale of EV charging uh, is such that these smart charging systems have to be considered as part of critical national infrastructure. By the mid 2030s, uh, if they uh, go wrong, they have potential for really major impacts on the grid. So that's the end of my sort of introduction to smart charging. Uh, and I've picked on a, a few examples here. At this point, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Martin Bradley, who will run through more details of a few very specific risks that we have identified. Over to Martin. Thank you, Andrew, and uh, thank you everyone for joining the webinar and a uh, special hello to my former colleagues from National Grid. Uh, my name is Martin Bradley. I spent most of my career working for National Grid and uh, about 20 years of that working at the Electricity National Control Centre in Wokingham. And my focus was mainly on the uh, software systems and tools that were used for running the grid and also the data models that uh, fed into those. So. As Andrew said, I'm going to summarise six key areas where we believe electric vehicle charges may pose a risk to grid security. Um, so uh, step, where too many charges switch on or off at the same moment. A ramp related to that, where too many charges switching on or off within a few minutes. Oscillations, where a group of charges may switch on and off repeatedly. Uh, stability, and this is more an issue to manage rather than a risk, uh, because electric vehicle charges, their characteristics are less benign in terms of the grid than traditional domestic loads. Demand control, these are measures available to the system operator in the rare event that it looks like there won't be enough generation to meet demand, and those will become less effective with the growth in EVs. And lastly, restoration, which is the process of getting the lights back on after a regional or national loss of supply. And we've, our concern is that EV chargers may exhibit some erratic behavior during that process, making the uh, restoration more challenging. So the first area I'm gonna talk about is steps and uh, where too many chargers switch on or off at the same time. Uh, and Andrew's already talked about time of use tariffs and how we might refer to as the first generation smart charging can produce sudden loads, load steps when the price drops. So the graph on the right is from the Electric Nation project, which was a large scale EV charging trial from about 2016 to 2019. And the blue line represents the demand that they observed with no smart charging, no time of use tariffs. And then the red line shows what happened when they introduced time of use tariffs. And you can see obviously there's a very sharp increase in demand at the start of the low price uh, period. And in fact, this effect from smart charging can be seen on the grid uh, every day. So the graph on the left shows system frequency uh, in the period just after midnight. So the blue line is the frequency and the orange line is the rate of change of frequency. And what you can see first at midnight and then more clearly at half past midnight is the frequency drops as smart charging loads switch on within seconds of the start of the settlement period. And that's reflected in a, a spike in the rate of change of frequency at midnight and at half past midnight. So this effect is already there, but as long as it's relatively small, it's not a problem for grid operation. And if it's around, we think this may be around to one or 200 megawatts step there. But if we roll the clock forward to when there's tens or maybe even more than hundred gigawatts of EV charges on the system, uh, by 2035, if just 2% of EV charges switch on at the same time, this would be more severe than the August 2019 events that we saw. 
So many of you, I'm sure, will be familiar with that, but for those who aren't, uh, there was a lightning strike on a 400 kV circuit in England that caused the trip of a wind farm and an associated trip of a steam turbine in the gas fired power station. At the same time, it also triggered tripping about 500 megawatts of embedded generation. Uh, that was well beyond uh, the requirements for the grid to secure the loss of infeed, and the frequency fell and operated low frequency demand tripping relays to about a million consumers have disconnected and it caused significant disruption on the train network as well. So that was a, a serious incident, but you know, this statistic here for me is really scary one, just 2% of charges switch on at the same time, it will be more severe than that event. And in fact, if we look at the more perhaps optimistic scenarios for EV take up, it would only take 1% of charges switching at the same time to be more severe than the 2019 event. Uh, and that seems, uh, potentially a source of real concern, something we have to keep a very close eye on and work out how to manage that risk going forward. So that's one form of uh, or one mechanism by which steps might occur. Another is coincident tripping. So we know uh, that grid faults can trip power electronic devices like renewable generators, as I just described for the uh, 2019 incident where 500 megawatts tripped. Uh, another incident last year in Texas where 1100 megawatts of solar PV tripped following a fault in a generator transformer. And the chart on the right shows uh, some of the analysis of that Texas incident. And about a third of the generation trips due to what's called phase lock loop loss of synchronism. Uh, a phase lock loop is a control system that keeps track of the voltage on the grid so that power can be injected correctly. If it loses track of voltage on the grid, then it will trip its local device. And that caused about a third of the tripping in Texas. There was also tripping due to over voltages either at the inverter or on the feeder. Now, our concern is that EV chargers will share design features with the renewable generation that's exhibited this behavior. So they'll have the same vulnerabilities. So EV chargers will use phase lock loops. They will also have over voltage protection. And because they're power semiconductor devices, uh, they are very sensitive to over voltages. So vendors will uh, so sets the over voltage protection as low as they're allowed to to avoid the equipment getting damaged. So there's a risk that a fault on the grid, as well as posing a risk to generation, might also cause widespread tripping of EV charges. So that was step. The next area is ramps with too many charges switching on or off in a few minutes. Now, the issue of steps from smart charging systems uh, has been recognized, of course, and in the regulations that were brought out last year, they mandated a randomization for the start of the uh, EV charging. Uh, so once it starts, wants to start to charge it, it's given a random delay, which is uh, defaults to a 10 minute period. But obviously the concern is if there's more than 20 gigawatts of load to be managed away from the peak, a 10 minute randomization is not going to solve the problem. And just for, as a point of reference, two gigawatts per minute is more than 10 times faster than the normal morning pickup uh, that we see on the grid. And certainly wouldn't be possible for uh, the grid to cope with that rate of change of demand. Now, of course, there may be some self-limiting elements of that, that if 20 gigawatts try to switch on in a single settlement period, then it would no longer be a cheap period. So the effect will be self-limiting to some extent. But if we look at the behavior of interconnectors, we see that present day market players still can want to swing you know, a gigawatt or more at the transition from one settlement period to another. So it's not obvious at what point that self-limiting might happen. And also the 20 gigawatts uh, here is still only about 10% of the EV population. So there's a lot more vehicles may want to charge over the course of the night. So there are gonna be very high levels of load that's gonna to have to be moved around through smart charging. And it's certainly not clear that 10 minute randomization will be enough to provide a smooth and manageable profile to that. Also, of course, there may be other mechanisms giving rise to ramps, uh, either by human response or automated responses to news. Uh, Andrew talked about the storms we've had recently. So if people know there's a storm coming, they may think, oh, I better charge my vehicle so it's ready in case I lose my supply. So that could cause you know, like a, a ramp in demand. But also if the system operator publishes a margin notice uh, saying that there's you know, potential shortage of supply at uh, you know, some point in the next 24 hours, then either people may respond to that or there may be AI built into charging systems which will automatically respond to that. 
So again, another potential for a large ramp in response to events. So the next area we looked at uh, is oscillations. Now, oscillations do happen on the grid from time to time, not often, fortunately, but occasionally they can happen due to interactions between control systems. Uh, so this example on the right happened uh, last year in the northern part of the GB power grid. Uh, we don't know the exact causes, or at least I don't personally, but likely to be interaction between generators, HVD link controllers, other smart devices on the grid. And there have been other examples in other parts of the world as well. So if we think about how the smart charging system is going to work, uh, it will be complex. And I'll kind of talk you through this uh, bowl of spaghetti on the right of the, the slide here. Uh, so in the center, there's the EV service equipment, the charge point. Uh, you have your EV here, and then you have all the parties who have an interest in how that EV is charged. You've obviously got the vehicle owner who can control it manually or through the app. You've got the EV manufacturer who may bundle charging services in with the vehicle. You've got an energy company who may be providing a time of use tariff. You've got the home energy management system, which would be trying to coordinate charging of the vehicle with other high power loads in your home. Then down here, we have the network operators. So ESO, who will be interested in purchasing national balancing services through the intermediary of aggregators, but also the distribution networks and who will be wanting to limit demand on the local distribution network. And this is going to become increasingly important as the years go by, as the networks get saturated with EV chargers and heat pumps. So the demand has to be carefully managed to stay within the capability of the existing infrastructure. So there's quite a number of different parties who will be looking to manage the charging of your EV, and they'll be using a number of uh, communication networks to do that. So there's the internet, there's the smart meter communication network, which may be used, there's the mobile phone network as well. So there's a lot of component parts, a lot of moving parts in this smart potential smart charging system. Of course, we don't know if it'll look exactly like this. It may well evolve in different forms, but it's likely to be complex. And with all these different control systems with different algorithms, uh, there is the potential for undesirable and unforeseen interaction between them that might lead to oscillatory behavior. And of course, that has to be looked at under both normal conditions and abnormal conditions as well. The next area we considered was the impact of EV charging on the stability of the grid, which is the capability of the grid to ride through fault events and disturbances. Now, traditionally, domestic loads have been quite benign in terms of the grid. They might exhibit a characteristic like the dotted line here. So as the voltage goes up, their load goes up, and as the voltage falls, their demand falls. EV charges, by contrast, will be largely constant power loads. So there'll be no, effectively no change in power as the voltage varies over quite a wide range. And similarly, no change in demand uh, as the frequency varies either. So they'll offer no relief to the grid. And this will have an impact on the voltage stability of the grid, also the transient and oscillatory stability, which is how the grid responds in the short term to fault events. It will be less benign. That effect will happen slowly and uh, the system operator continually studies the stability of the grid. So this shouldn't come sort of as a bolt out of the blue, but it does mean that the models that are used uh, to study that stability will need to evolve. And it may well have an impact in terms of reducing the transfer capability of the grid. So for example, we may be able to export less wind power from Scotland if EV charging is representing perhaps half the demand on the grid. A couple of other factors uh, to note. First of all, existing vehicle to grid designs don't provide any inertia to the grid. So this issue has been growing for some time now with the growth in renewable generation, which doesn't provide inertia. So falling inertia on the grid has uh, increased some of the challenges in grid operation. And as vehicle to grid generation grows, it will continue to amplify that effect. Also, vehicle to grid as designed at the moment won't come with power system stabilizers. Stabilizers, as the name suggests, help to stabilize the grid after its disturbance and they are mandatory for transmission connected generation. But at the moment, there's no requirement for vehicle to grid generation to provide that. And potentially you might be looking at 10 gigawatts or more of vehicle to grid generation. So these are some factors which may affect the stability of the grid. 
we move on to the next area now, which is demand control. And so as I said, these are measures which are available to the system operator in the rare circumstance where it looks like there may not be enough generation to meet demand. Uh, this comes in two forms. There's demand reduction by voltage reduction. And this is where the system operator asks distribution companies to reduce demand by lowering the voltage to consumers. And as we saw a moment ago for traditional loads, that is reasonably effective, but this will have no impact at all on EV charging loads. So as a measure available to uh, the system operator, that will have reduced effectiveness as these loads grow. The second form of demand control is demand disconnection. Fortunately, we use very rarely, uh, and this can be done either by direct instruction from the DNO or by the uh, operation of automatic low frequency relays. Now, of course, as we were saying just now, there may be vehicle to grid generation on the network in future. And this is increasingly likely as new G99 regulations may mandate under frequency support. So if the grid is already struggling, then charges may switch to generation mode where that's available. Of course, then if you trip a feeder, then not only do you lose the demand on that feeder, but you will also lose any vehicle to grid generation. Now, this effect, of course, is already with us uh, because of embedded solar generation. Uh, and has been changing the way uh, or the effectiveness of those measures already. But again, the growth in vehicle to grid will amplify that impact. So both of those measures, they won't become completely ineff ineffective, but they, their effectiveness will be eroded by the growth of this technology. So the last area we looked at uh, is restoration. So this is getting the lights back on after loss of supply. And again, it's been a bit too much in the news recently. But if we consider a, a short power outage, then if you remember the, the bowl of spaghetti, the complex smart charging ecosystem, then that may take several minutes to recover. Routers will need to reboot, software systems will need to restart, communication links will need to be re-established. So in that kind of interim period before the smart charging system is woken up, and as Andrew talked about earlier, then it's possible EVs may default to zero charging or even worse, default to full charging with very high potential high levels of overload and with the kind of the double whammy there as well. But even the default to zero charging option is not an ideal one because in a restoration scenario, you're progressively uh, synchronizing generators, energizing circuits, connecting up demand. So what you may find is you energize a particular area, connect some demand, you move on to the next area, and then several minutes later, suddenly a load of demand comes on as the smart charging system wakes up. So that could make the restoration process quite an uncomfortable one. If we then consider whether it's been a sustained power outage lasting maybe for hours or even days uh, in that unfortunate event, then when the power does come back on, most EVs will want to charge either because the batteries are run down already or through uh, customers being precautionary and thinking, well, the power may go off again, so I better charge my EV. And you know, if the power's been off for a while, this may create a massive and long lasting cold load pickup on top of loss of diversity from heat pumps and other types of demand. So loss of diversity uh, during a restoration scenario is well recognized. So for many years, the situations are recognized where any thermostatic heaters, once the power has been off for a while, will all switch to the on position. So when the system is re-energized, more demand will come back than was on the system when it, was, uh, when it lost power. So that's a well-recognized phenomenon. But with the growth of these very high power and long duration uh, charging loads or heating loads, that effect, uh, that effect will be amplified very significantly. And that's gonna have a significant impact uh, on the restoration process. And as Andrew said, can risk either overloads on the local infrastructure or even on grid supply transformers potentially. And then if like the, th the third key area we've been concerned about is that during the restoration process, there'll be larger than usual fluctuations in voltage and frequency. The, the grid will be well outside its normal operating parameters. Uh, and when you energize new pieces of equipment, when you energize new areas of lows, there'll be larger disturbances than you would normally see on the grid. Now, short-lived high or low voltage transits may cause EV charges to trip. Uh, high rates of change of frequency may also cause them to trip either due to a rate of change of frequency, rock-off protection, or else the phase lock loop unlocking that we talked about earlier where the control system loses track of the grid voltage. 
and there is potential for cascade effects there. So if it's a high voltage transient, if some EV charges trip on over voltage protection, that will raise the voltage further on the feeder, which might cause other charges to trip, and there could be a cascade or sort of domino effect. And of course, that risk is also present during normal operation as well. You know, particularly, for example, during high solar days, when voltages are running high on the distribution network, if there's an event that causes the volts to step upwards, that could cause cascade tripping of EV charges. Uh, and coming back to restoration, if large volumes of EV charges trip, that could certainly disrupt the restoration process or even set it back to the beginning. So those are the six areas of concern that we've identified as the volumes of EV charging to scale up in the years to come. Uh, steps, ramps, potential for oscillations, uh, the impact on system stability, impact on the effectiveness of demand control measures, and the impact on the restoration process. Now, I'm conscious I've been talking about a lot of kind of negative effects from EVs. Uh, of course, EVs are fantastic news for the environment, and also the sort of software control uh, for them does create lots of new opportunities as well in terms of grid operation. But if we stay with the kind of level of technology, the kind of market designs that we have at the moment, then we think there are going to be serious issues emerging as uh, the volumes grow. Uh, and on that note, uh, I'm going to hand back to Andrew. Okay, well, uh, thanks very much, uh, Martin, for that. And just to, to pick up on uh, Martin's final point there, uh, the, the centre of this slide is power outage. And uh, we've identified within the activity so far a number of potential risks which could lead to power outage. Uh, the reality of the situation and the whole purpose of uh, this activity uh, is that we are looking into the future uh, and being able to allow enough time between now and these issues arising uh, that we can update systems and uh, improve the design and performance uh, across the whole infrastructure as we go through each generation of uh, market design, each generation of smart charging design. Uh, so we're not expecting these things uh, to happen in reality in a large scale, because we are sure uh, that as a, a community uh, looking to provide these services and uh, modernize the grid as we move towards net zero, we will actually work together to prevent these things happening. So as a, uh, a summary, we have these, and uh, in the UK, uh, the transition to uh, electric uh, transport uh, has now been legislated for. Uh, we will see everybody uh, moving to electric cars and electric vans, uh, though uh, that will happen uh, over the, the next 10 to 15 years by the time uh, that uh, some of the installed base of EV uh, of um, ICE uh, vehicles uh, stop being used. So it's the late 2030s when we see there will be a uh, total mass uh, adoption of EVs. Um, we are forecasting that there could be up to 100 gigawatts of EVs connected and smart charging at any particular time. And one of the reasons why there could be uh, a very large number of vehicles connected uh, is because of vehicle to grid. So vehicle to grid gives the opportunity for uh, the EV to contribute uh, to stability of the grid. Uh, it provides access to the EV battery uh, as a storage mechanism, and that has many advantages. That will actually encourage EV owners to, uh, the, the financial incentives are likely to be in place to encourage EV owners uh, by default to leave their vehicle plugged in much more often than you would otherwise see. So the likelihood is there could be very large number of uh, vehicles connected even when they are not charging. And going back uh, to my earlier comments of introducing myself and saying I was involved in the, the transition from analog phones 
uh, uh, to digital cell phones. Well, in some respects, there are some uh, analogies here. We are moving uh, into the uh, era of smart charging and smart charging is very much uh, in its infancy. Uh, we're the equivalent of the, the first generation phones, the, the things which are uh, really effective, really exciting, uh, get engagement from the early adopters. Uh, but are uh, no way reflect what is going to be there in place uh, in 15 years uh, time when we have true mass adoption. So there are multiple generations of technology that will uh, take place uh, over the remainder of this decade and into the next, which gives us the opportunity to prepare for the type of risks that we have identified. Uh, that means that we need to consider aspects of whole system design. There are things which will need to change in terms of regulations. Uh, the current standards in this area are emerging. The, the sort of uh, smart charging regulations, the uh, British Standards Institute Energy Smart Appliances activity, there's all sorts of great activity happening in this area. Um, there will be radically different uh, market uh, design uh, in the 2030s for the electricity market uh, compared to what it is now. Uh, I again suggest everybody takes a look at the report. Within that, we highlight some of the challenges uh, behind uh, the half hourly settlement interval, uh, which is currently in existence that Martin highlighted, where uh, it embeds step changes into the system every half hour. Um, what we are looking to do going forward uh, through these regulations, standardization, market uh, design activity uh, is to ensure that we maintain system operability. So this is the ability to ensure that the supply of energy to consumers is done so on a consistent, reliable and cost-effective basis. And one of the biggest challenges for the industry uh, is the need to update and enhance regulations and standards across uh, a really broad area, and at the same time, not stifle innovation. So I come from a background of innovating and bringing new technologies uh, to market across a broad range of sectors. Uh, and I remember the benefits that came from uh, the GSM standard, uh, which introduced good standardization across the mobile phone industry uh, and allowed for uh, massive reductions in costs and economies of scale across that sector. Regulations and standards uh, and all the headaches that come with that are an absolute pain in the neck for people like me trying to innovate and to produce products. But without them, there is a serious risk and the six risks that Martin highlighted in terms of being able to maintain system operability. Uh, and I'd encourage everyone involved in the industry uh, to recognize that fact and work constructively to make sure that we have timely uh, and appropriate uh, changes in regulations and standards uh, and actively contribute to uh, those activities. And, and do so where we have a vision. And part of that vision is saying, what's the equivalent of the, the 5G of smart charging? What is it that we are aiming for in 10 or 15 years time? Um, so I picked up on a, a comment from uh, Julian Leslie from National Grid ESO uh, at the recent COP26. And he highlighted quite how big a change uh, what is happening for uh, grid operators. So in the past, as I've said, historically, generation has been varied to match uh, demand. Uh, so uh, the change in the future is that um, the grid operators won't be dis dispatching generation to match demand. They will be dispatching some of the demand uh, to match the available generation. Uh, and that is uh, reflecting the fact that we are going to be trying to reduce the size of the peak to the average to make more efficient use uh, of the installed networks 
and reduce the need for massive investment in reinforcement. Uh, and at the same time, what we're trying to do is do that in a way which is good for consumers. And, and in terms of being good for consumers, that's providing products which are easy for them to use, easy for them to understand, and provide a cost-effective supply of electricity. We all know the short-term uh, challenges there are at the moment uh, with the very high uh, costs of uh, fossil fuel uh, gas. We are hoping to move to a position where uh, by 2050, we will be operating uh, in a net zero environment where the marginal cost of generation uh, is pretty close to zero uh, because when the wind blows, uh, the, the turbines are there to generate electricity uh, and the, the same in terms of uh, solar resources. And from Cygenesis standpoint, what we're trying uh, to do is work on technologies which are looking at the charger modules in vehicles and roadside chargers and being able to provide uh, systems which have really uh, smart communication and control systems. And not only implement basic smart charging, the 1G, 2G type systems that we'll have at the moment, but address some of the risks that we've identified uh, in this report and provide highly dependable, resilient operation, uh, which provides the type of services which are needed by grid operators. That will include uh, vehicle to grid, um, and for those who are familiar with grid forming controls on inverters, um, we're expecting to see grid forming uh, coming uh, to V2G as well, uh, potentially with the capability, therefore, of being able to provide reactive power and inertia services. So this is taking the type of capabilities that you only see in transmission connected large scale uh, resources, currently renewable energy resources, uh, and only just emerging technology, and then actually being a uh, commonplace uh, in EVs. To address some of the issues regarding resilience and what happens within a, a storm, um, overhead power cables, uh, infrastructure is going to continue to be damaged uh, by severe storms. There is no getting away from that. Um, better maintenance in some situations, some in, in reinforcement will help, but we will still be in a, a situation where se uh, severe storms will cause damage to infrastructure. One of the great capabilities that uh, EVs will have is that capability to provide power to your home from the vehicle. So using the stored energy in the battery uh, to power your home. And in most situations, power outages are, are typically a few hours uh, to a, a day or so. Uh, the vast majority are fixed within that time frame. Vehicle to home uh, has the capability uh, to uh, provide power for that type of duration. Uh, if you are in a situation where you're not using heating, uh, the amount of energy stored in a, a typical vehicle battery uh, might be enough to power a, a house in the UK uh, for four or five days, maybe by the 2030s with larger batteries for more than a week. And we anticipate more generally that distribution companies will make much greater use uh, of this emerging technology uh, to encourage uh, island operation. So this is the ability to power a, a small region, a small community disconnected from the national grid uh, for a short period of time. So you imagine a, a, a village of a few hundred houses at the end uh, of a 10 mile long overhead cable across fields with trees around, wouldn't it be great if that community, uh, that village could power itself uh, while uh, there were repairs being made uh, to the cable connecting. So that gives you a vision of the potential for 5G smart charging in the future. If we come back to Project Rev, um, the next steps that we have are to keep working with National Grid ASO uh, to raise awareness uh, within the industry. So as I said, the objective of our first work package 
was to identify uh, the problems and the risks and make people aware of them. And hopefully we've managed to do that uh, through this webinar and through the report. We're moving on to do some simulation studies so that we, uh, within a second work package, to confirm some of the key findings, to look at the size and scale and actually try and put some numbers behind the risks. And from that, to be able to provide a more detailed analysis of the things that we consider are most serious. And we're likely to provide some output, which we will hope to contribute into grid code and other regulatory activities, uh, addressing the short term uh, issues, uh, which, which we uh, can do over the time period of the remainder of this project. Uh, and as I've said, uh, within our business, Sygensis, uh, our aim is to leverage the real incredible potential of the power converters, uh, which are in uh, EVs, that capability of being able to provide bi-directional power flow and energy storage to help balance the system, uh, meet demand on public grids, on microgrids, uh, be able to provide that uh, vehicle to home capability, and uh, to provide more resilient power as we go forward, and to do so in a way which is as cost effective as possible. So uh, to finish the presentation part of this, uh, I would like to thank a, a really broad range of people involved. So I couldn't have done this uh, without uh, the, the team in Sygensis, uh, and thanks to all of them, some of them are in the room next to me here, um, the project has uh, been supported financially by National Grid ESO, uh, but beyond that, we've had access to a broad range of expertise and contribution from them. Uh, we've had support from the Energy Systems Catapult here in the UK, who have a really broad uh, systems understanding, and input from uh, UK Power Networks, uh, a UK distribution network operator, uh, the Electric Power Research Institute in the USA, uh, because as I've said, the key thing about looking at solutions uh, to these problems are it is an international uh, uh, situation. Many of the problems that we have to resolve will be uh, ultimately addressed through international standards. And alongside that, we had input from the National Physical Laboratory, who are representatives uh, from the UK on a number of uh, standards uh, organisations. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, all of the authors for the references that we quote within the Work Package 1 report, and for a really broad range of other people for sharing their expertise. Uh, what I need to emphasize is that we are trying to forecast the future. We're trying to predict what might happen. And we've been using a little bit of a, a crystal ball in doing some of this and some good engineering expertise as well. Uh, the report for Work Package 1 uh, is Sygensis view. It's not uh, the views of the other organizations I've mentioned below. They've provided input. Uh, but the final result uh, is our view of the situation. I hope that the report is useful uh, to you. Uh, we're going to try and answer the questions, some of the questions that you've raised. Um, and I have a couple of questions uh, for you, which are, what are the biggest risks that we might have missed? Um, uh, sorry, what are the biggest risks overall of the ones that we've mentioned? Uh, and what are the things that we might have missed? We are not perfect. We are trying to predict the future, which is a real challenge. And going forward, we're really keen on collaboration. So we'll try and answer as many of the questions as we can get through uh, during the next 15 minutes or so. But please, if you have any questions at all, would like to collaborate in future, please get, uh, get in touch using the email uh, given on the presentation uh, and also uh, in the report itself. So I just need to stop sharing my screen here, if I can find the right button. And hopefully, yep, that should have taken you. Back. So uh, at this point, uh, what I'd like to do is start by trying to 
uh, address uh, some of the questions that have been coming in in the chat. I've had the opportunity to go through uh, a few of those, and I'd like to just pick up on a few general points uh, to start with. And those are about, can we generate a, enough energy for this? Uh, do we have a, enough storage to be able to cope with this? Um, and my answer to that is, I'd love to talk more about that, but that's really outside the scope of the project. And therefore, I want to try and focus on some of the questions which are more relevant to the risks that we have raised. And Martin, if you'd like to come and join me here, uh, I'd like to start by just asking you uh, one of the questions which was uh, about storage heaters and economy seven and a bit of history there. Uh, uh, yes. Do you want to give so, some of the background to that? Uh, so as somebody pointed out, um, there's been a, a long history of uh, if you like, time of use tariffs in the form of economy seven. Uh, and uh, I recall many years ago, a control engineer saying to me that um, the kind of the first half hour in that part of the morning was the most expensive half hour of the day because they had to run an oil fired unit at four lead to cope with the rate of rise of demand from economy seven switching. So <laughs> we've been here before, uh, that's uh, a a mechanism which is designed to uh, uh, exploit low cost energy can actually introduce extra costs and complexity. That's, I guess that's what you're thinking yeah. of there, Andrew. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for that. And um, uh, there have been a, a number of comments uh, or questions uh, which have included the mention of the word cyber. Um, and cyber security within these systems uh, is a real concern. And I think. I made the point in the presentation that our expectation is, however careful we are in terms of cybersecurity, there are risks that part of the systems uh, may be hacked at some point. Uh, and one of the key areas within that uh, is to look at graceful degradation and trying to ensure that the system still remains operable even in the situation uh, where there has been a, a successful cyber attack in parts of the system. We need to do everything we can to prevent it, uh, but there are no very, very few systems that can justify uh, the expectation of being totally uh, secure. Martin, do you want to pick up on the... Um, yes, yeah, so there's one question, just a point of detail, Andrew, about so, uh, GC0137 grid forming uh, inverters, which are just, are we aware of it? I think the answer is yes, we are aware, but thank you yes. for pointing so, that out. So uh, GC0137 uh, is uh, looking at grid forming inverters and being able to provide uh, grid forming technology. Uh, the uh, National Grid have published a um, specification. It's one of the first in the world which is publicly available from a, a grid operator. And for anyone interested in grid forming technology, uh, it's a really good place to to start looking for uh, the type of requirements which are going to be needed uh, within these services. Okay, thanks. Uh, There's another comment from someone about we may see uh, increased movement to electrification in the short term. Uh, I think everyone recognizes it's really difficult trying to forecast these market movements. Uh, and I think everyone is keenly aware that pretty much everybody was caught out by the rapid growth in solar PV generation in this country and I think probably elsewhere in the world. Uh, so everyone's cautious about forecast of the future. Uh, and yeah, I think we just, everyone recognised we need to treat these numbers with uh, a suitable pinch of salt. And, and I think one of, the, uh, one of the most challenging questions that uh, we've been asked in, in the last few weeks uh, is given these risks, uh, how soon are the first of them going to appear and be real? Uh, and that's something we'll look at uh, trying to address within Work Package 2 in, in terms of identifying which of these are likely to appear soonest. Um, but our whole vision within this project has been to try and look a long period out into the future where we have mass adoption of EVs. Uh, a large number of groups have tended, what is the next step and the next step? within this presentation and within the report, what we've tried to do is concentrate on mass adoption in the 2030s. Yep, thanks Andrew. And um, so there's been some really interesting both questions, comments and discussion in the chat. So thank you everyone for that. Um, 
uh, Hans Armis sort of posed a bit of a comment and a question, uh, are there going to be bottlenecks on the LV uh, distribution system that will prevent some of this growth in demand? Uh, I think the, the question of bottlenecks on the LV is uh, you know, going to be a really significant one. And in fact, that may, well, the solution to that may also limit some of the potential for step changes or steep ramps in demand because it may be throttled right down at the LV network. But of course, that won't apply everywhere. So it won't, I'm sure it won't solve the problem, but in some parts of the LV network, uh, I think there's going to be have, have to be some form of load sharing solution, which may result in just a kind of completely flat load profile on that part of the network for long periods of time. And I think one of the other things to recognize is at the moment, uh, the low voltage network uh, has relatively little instrumentation in it. There's very uh, little visibility of power flows in the detail down at secondary distribution uh, transformer level. Uh, um, some of the overload risks happen at that level. And there are some real challenges in terms of how to get the instrumentation in place and arrange automatic network management systems that uh, uh, manage those overloads and specifically uh, during fault conditions as well, uh, where communication loss may occur. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's one uh, question around generators, where the generators are tripped by low frequency demand disconnection relays. Um, they're not, that, those relays just apply to parts of the distribution network, not the sort of transmission generators. They have a kind of separate range of frequency with which they must stay synchronized, and it's a wider range of frequencies you'd expect. Uh, we've talked about Cyber Opaz 1878. Okay. Yeah, so um, I mentioned the uh, British Standards Institute um, Energy Smart Appliance Activity. And for anyone not familiar, uh, that's publicly available, available standard uh, 1878 and 1879. Uh, there are some great features uh, within that uh, in terms of being able to introduce our smart uh, charging capability but also to come up with a common approach which can be applied beyond EVs to other devices as well. Uh, and I'd recommend anyone uh, takes a look at it. Uh, again, I would highlight that uh, it is an emerging standard. It's in development. Further work uh, is required on that. Uh, Bayes are actively uh, looking uh, to develop that uh, further and look at setting up uh, test capabilities for that. Broad engagement is needed within the industry uh, to make sure we consider the, the broad range of uh, potential impacts uh, that we need to address. Um, and that standard, again, uh, provides references out to cybersecurity requirements, which similarly are covered uh, with some of the a uh, recent uh, statutory instrument on uh, EV charging from uh, the government. So cybersecurity is being taken seriously already uh, for this. Um, it's something that will continue to, to be an issue and continue to re require ongoing investment from all involved. Okay. So another question here, which I think is uh, perhaps a couch in slightly provocative terms from iPad 2. Uh, what EV uptake percentage will ESO have to kill the market and take direct control of all the charges to keep the lights on? Will that even be possible if the charges aren't built to the right standards now? I guess that's the $64 million question, uh, which in the mitigations part we'll be looking at in the next stage of the project, uh, we'll need to discuss um, you know, with ESO and other parties uh, how to address these risks. Uh, I mean, for me personally, I struggle to see that uh, kind of half hour based uh, markets will be able to address or solve all the problems that we have identified. But I think it's a question of watch this space really as to what we think answers might be. Uh, and some of them may be straightforward. There are some things we've talked about already which will help to mitigate the risks. But I think there's still uh, quite a lot of the new work, the new thinking needed in this area. Uh, I'm just gonna see if there's one or two more. Uh, Questions to uh, answer from here. Uh, 
Uh, what's the future of ultra rapid EV charging okay. in the LV distribution network? And perhaps this will be the last okay. question. Yeah. Yes. So, so, so yes, um, within the presentation, um, we focused on EV charging at home. We focused on nominally saying that that is likely uh, to be around the seven kilowatt level. Uh, so that is a reflection of uh, the UK or the GB market and the, the, the GB grid design. So seven kilowatt uh, level is based on 32 amps, which is a uh, typical maximum uh, single circuit from uh, within a home. Um, and higher power charging uh, in beyond that power level uh, typically would require a three phase supply. Um, G in the UK, uh, domestic properties generally don't have three phase. Uh, there is some move in terms of new build and renovation uh, to put uh, three phase power in that might allow uh, charging typically to somewhere around the 22 uh, kilowatt or potentially a bit more. Uh, but in terms of the, the rapid, ultra rapid, depending on what term you care to use, uh, getting into the uh, hundreds of kilowatts or more uh, is a major demand. So uh, a typical LV distribution uh, transformer might be uh, 315 kVA. So uh, being able to provide uh, 300 kilowatts roughly, and that uh, typically might uh, supply 150 houses. Uh, being able to provide that much power to an individual uh, uh, charge point uh, for domestic or commercial directly off the LV network uh, is a major uh, demand for the distribution network operators uh, to handle. Um, and the location uh, of uh, already the location and installation of uh, EV chargers at those types of power levels um, from a commercial standpoint is restricted uh, based on the grid design and the spare capacity in, in that local area. Um, that's something that we have to recognise going forward. Um, yeah, it's perhaps worth commenting in passing, just noting one of the comments that's coming on the chat. You know, we've only been looking at uh, electric cars and the numbers we've been talking about here. Um, in the uh, ESO's future energy scenarios, they also look at uh, vans and trucks, HGV vehicles, Vans are in the numbers about 10 to 15 percent of cars, but on their hand, are likely to have a more intensive charging schedule. Numbers of uh, HCVs are much lower, but again, higher power charging. Um, and I think <laughs> the last question: Are we optimists or pessimists uh, regarding the future? Um, so let, let, let me uh, give you a bit of history. When I first worked on Generation One mobile phones, uh, testing them. Uh, if the, I picked up a phone and dialed the one next to it and I got through and we got through 70% of the time, that product was good enough to ship. Um, uh, I was an optimist then uh, and I'm an optimist now. Uh, I believe we will be able to address the uh, issues that we've identified within this report. We will have missed issues and there will be problems along the way. But the key thing is that we work together as an industry to address those problems. Um, and I really do mean it. Please do get in touch with any questions. Uh, we have a really large level of interest in terms of this uh, webinar. Uh, there are multiple hundreds of people who have registered and are attending on time. We're expecting many others to watch the video later on. But please do get in touch via the email address. Uh, we'll try and answer as many of the questions as, as possible um, and look forward to working with you in the future to turn it into a success and achieve net zero 2050. Uh, so at that point, I'd like to just thank Martin for uh, his efforts. Thank you very much for your attention and uh, look forward to driving our EVs. Yes. Thanks again for all the comments and uh, discussion as well. Okay. Goodbye. Cheerio. Bye.